Hello and welcome to today's presentations. A few reminders before we get started. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on demand. A follow-up email will be sent to those of you watching live to access the recording. Questions will be taken at the end of the presentation, so feel free to enter them into the portal as we go along. So a little bit about us. I'm Felicia and I'm a director here at Data Theorem. The company was started in 2013, and our leaders at Data Theorem have over 15 years of experience in the security industry. They've either, either started the companies or worked for the companies you see here on the left. They are also thought leaders in the security industry and have authored several books about security as well. Data Theorem helps customers continuously analyze and secure modern applications and APIs to avoid data breaches. We secure mobile, cloud, and web apps. This mission has led us to working with just a few of the customers you see here. You can take a look at some of their customer stories on our website, datatheorem.com. Here's a reminder of what we'll be covering today. Today's discussion, discussion is essentially about proactive security or DevSecOps strategies. We all aim to resolve a breach before exposure, but the catch is knowing how to fix it before it happens. Security automation, if done right, will find the problem, provide solutions, and stop leaky data without having to hire security specialists. Today, we'll be focusing on security automation on AWS. So before we go further, uh, I would like to show you an example of an open S3 bucket. This is an example of actual leaky raw data that was exposed onto the public internet. What you see here are this, uh, on the right side are the specific geolocations of individual app users. You can see the user's ID on the left side circled in red. Beyond privacy concerns and government regulations, no company wants to do this. They don't want to expose their customers' PII or personally identifiable information. This is what is usually brought to our attention, and many times the company cannot even identify which employee made the mistake. So when we talk about security automation, we are talking about integration security uh, that is excuse me, security that is integrated into developer and IT processes so that vulnerabilities can be found in pre-production as well as the software, uh, once the software update has been re released. This model you see here, the three main pillars of DevSecOps um, is from a, a friend of ours, Doug Cahill at ESG. Today we'll focus on this third pillar for this presentation. This is what must be done to avoid leaky data or breaches. The ultimate goal of any security strategy, again, is to resolve issues quickly and safely. So why aren't all companies doing this? Well, most companies are trying to do this, but are maybe missing a few things. They don't have the, the ability to find what's wrong, who has access, and no alerts were set up. There's just not enough urgency. Another key point is that sh this should be easy to implement and also easy to roll back. Not all issues can be auto-remediated. And if it has been done in the wrong situation, it should be just as easy to go ahead and roll back so that you can address the issue properly. So for a program to work, goal number one would be to avoid alert fatigue and false positives. Um, it's very important to go ahead and prioritize just the critical alerts that you need teams to go ahead and address first. Um, but also the ability to set policies for different teams that deal with compliance and regulations. Goal number two, according to last year's Verizon data breach investigations report, 56% of data breaches took months or longer to discover. So with the current strategies, the data remains exposed and you have no idea how long it was exposed or who accessed it. This is security's biggest concern, and yet we constantly still get email notices about breaches that happened three, six months, or even a year ago. So what took so long? Why didn't anyone know about a shadow API that was created? When taking a proper DevSecOps approach, there isn't a button you have to push. It finds it and stops it based on 
known hacking practices or by policies, again, set by your own teams. So if we approach this properly with a DevSecOps approach, you can eliminate or reduce exposure time, increase uptime, but also discover new issues 24 seven. You can save time by stopping leaky data and analyzing issues at the same time, as well as get a full inventory of your APIs and ultimately increase uptime and avoid being in that 50% of breaches that go unnoticed until it's too late. The main goal of auto remediation is this third goal, and it's supposed to fix violations quickly, but let's not skip any steps or tools that are vital. Being able to do this means that you also have integration um, so that your alerts about any violation, excuse me, any violation, as well as auto remediation can be communicated to the appropriate teams. Having security automation that identifies who the violation belongs to is vital, especially if you work with third party vendors or in a large enterprise. Being involved in the development stage obviously helps to understand where auto remediation will work before the APIs are put into the cloud. And lastly, before we start our demo, I wanna go ahead and show an example here. Um, this is from a current banking customer that we've been working with, and their third-party app developer was pushing back on a particular issue that they didn't think was critical. I realize the text here in red is a little bit hard to read, but uh, essentially our support team was sent the message you see here to re or, or sent this to reiterate why it was important which data was vulnerable, where the problem was, along with noting which specific attacks that they would be vulnerable to if they did not resolve it. There are definitely more details to this situation not shown here, including recommended code that was given to resolve the issue quickly, but you may need a vendor with experience that can tell you what to do instead of having your team Googling how to fix something or watching a YouTube video for help. So now we'd like to show you a few examples of when it's appropriate to use auto remediation. Um, I shared the example of the open S3 bucket uh, earlier in the presentation. And now my colleague, James, will take you through a few more examples here. To finish, uh, I introduce a bit myself. I'm James, I'm a backend engineer. I worked on auto remediation feature uh, for AWS. Uh, which uh, Felicia presented a bit before. So I make a demo of it. So the demo is uh, about an SQS queue that is uh, unauthenticated. Um, an SQS queue is um, a AWS service for uh, queuing messages. It's often used in uh, uh, application, mobile application, web application to uh, communicate from the web server to uh, processing servers. Uh, you usually have a request queue and a response queue. So uh, I show you why an authentic unauthenticated queue may lead to um, user data leak or um, malicious server requests. So um, let's uh, let's imagine we we have a cab reservation app. So this app. Uh, so you, when the user opens the app, it, uh, it sends um, geolog data to the server, so um, it can show the uh, it can show the the drivers that are around and also uh, um, fix the the price for uh, a journey. Um, so. The, the application will connect to an, an API gateway, uh, which is authenticated. So everything here is fine, but uh, this authenticated API gateway is connected to um, an SQS queue, uh, one for the request and another one for the, the response. The, the queue is un unauthenticated, so we will see why uh, this may be uh, a problem. Um, you can, you may imagine it's fine because everything happened be behind uh, authenticated API gateway, but uh, I show you why this is uh, not um, fine. So let's uh, let's imagine now we we have a malicious user who find 
the unauthenticated queues. Um, so in our case of uh, Cab Reservation App, the request app may con request queue may contain um, user data such as geolog or uh, even uh, personal info uh, like photos and things like that. So the the malicious user can uh, read any message of the this queue. Uh, so this leads to user data leak. He, he can also write to to those queues. Um, if he writes on the uh, request queue, he can uh, spoof any user and uh, also um, make a denial of service uh, on the system uh, by sending um, hundreds or thousands of messages quickly. So the the service will be uh, out shortly. Also, it can uh, write on the response queue, which uh, is the queue that sends responses to the user. Um, so this can be done by forking uh, response messages. Um, it, it also can um, purge this queue, meaning removing all messages from uh, the queue, uh, which will interrupt the, the service. I mean, if there are no messages in the queue, there is no uh, communication between the API gateway and the, the computing uh, that is used behind. So this will interrupt the, the service. I'll show you now uh, how this is done. So um, basically, we here send a message to the SQS queue where, with the URL you see on top of the of the screen, and we can see that uh, the response code is uh, 200. So that means we were able to um, send the message. Now we will fetch the, this message. So we also have uh, 200 status code uh, for the get operation. So we know that it was successful and we have retrieved the message, which is there. Yeah, and um, we will now uh, purge the queue, meaning there will be no message in in the queue uh, and we also have 200 in this case uh, so you can see that it's very easy it only needs to uh, have the url of the queue and uh, it's just a simple um, request to to it now um, i'll show you how um, auto remediation work in, in our portal so here is the, the policy violation page with the exactly same very same queue and uh, I'll, uh, I'll click on the remediate button and see what uh, what's happening so here we have uh, instructions that uh, explain how uh, to use the auto remediation. This will launch um, a script on uh, the AWS CloudFormation stack, and uh, then uh, will act on the behalf of the user to remediate the, the problem. So this is the the stack page here to allow uh, to create. Um, resources so here we first um, download all the necessary um, um, data for making the remediation and then we can see that the the stack is complete uh, and before deleting it uh, i would like to say that um, we uh, we currently uh, support only AWS, but uh, we will try to support other clouds uh, soon. So now, back to the 
the terminal. And now we, s we can see that we can't write to the queue. It's now 403 forbidden, so we've remediated the, the violation. This, uh, this queue is now denied in write access. And we will see that it's also uh, denied on read access. So we can't read it anymore, and we also can't purge the, the queue. Okay, James, thank you so much for that demo. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and provide a question, please go ahead and do so on the console, and we'll make our way through them uh, for a few minutes. Okay, um, so the first one um, that was already sent is, uh, is there a situation when it is not appropriate to use auto remediation? Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, auto remediation isn't suitable. Um, one common thing is um, vulnerabilities that need creation of uh, AWS KMS key to fix it uh, are not suitable to auto remediation. It would uh, require us to uh, create some keys, and uh, it's not want to to do. Um, for some reason, um, auto remediation uh, may prevent the service function to function as it used to be. Uh, for example, for public accessible resources, it may it may be still to interrupt the service for a few minutes than having some serious data leak. Okay, great. Um, another one is, does auto remediation grant data theorem right access? Uh, absolutely not. Um, everything AWS console, so uh, we don't have any right access on your resources. And uh, moreover, we, in most cases, we restricted the Lambda permissions to what it's, is mandatory to fix the, the problem. Perfect, really good question. Um, what happens in case of failure? Uh, in most cases, we should be able to put back the same configuration that was found at the start of the process, uh, meaning we will uh, roll back uh, any change that happened during the, the remediation and uh, you will uh, have exactly the same configuration you used to have. Okay, and it looks like this is the last one. Uh, do you have a plan to have auto remediation on other cloud providers? Uh, yes, uh, we are some tests uh, to provide the same kind of experience with uh, other cloud providers. Uh, we started a uh, test with uh, GCP, and uh, we will do um, some tests for Asia soon. So, yeah, we will keep you posted for for this matter, and we hope to have the auto remediation on every cloud platform we support. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, for those who are attending live as well as attending um, on demand, we'll go ahead and share these slides. And if you have any remaining questions, you can go ahead and email info at datatheorem.com. Or if you want a specific uh, meeting to see if this will work for you and your team, um, you can go ahead and go to our website and click contact. Um, and schedule a time with our team to go ahead and speak with you about that. So thank you so much, James, and everyone else. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.